So welcome everybody for yet another Cassandra Developer Workshop. Today I have, a, I am lucky, I have a very special guest, Maurice Eschold, um, co-founder of Typefox. So Maurice, thank you for being with, with, there with us. Can you please introduce yourself? <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, um, Cedric, for, for having me. Yeah, I'm co-founder of Typefox and we started several projects in, in recent years. One of them is SIA as an open source alternative to, to, VS, um, <clears throat> to VS Code, which is um, governed by an open source foundation, the Eclipse Foundation. And also um, a few years ago, we started the project Gitpod that will play a very big role in today's, um, in today's workshop. And Gitpod is a, is a great way of efficiently do coding um, in your web browser with, um, with all your, with your workspace on the, on the server end, on the server side. Yeah, and today you will use Gitpod and you will see how good it is for any kind of development. We are using Gitpod every week, but if it's the first time you attend, you will see how cool it is. So, let's get started. It's not only me and Moritz on screen. As usual, there is a full crew behind the scene answering your question in the chat. I already seen David and Alex answering a couple of questions. You can also ask longer questions on Discord. And let's get swirling. Oh, by the way, if you like the content we are doing, don't hesitate to subscribe. Yeah, just saying, moving on. So today, as usual, we are live on YouTube and Twitch. I think we try LinkedIn today. So maybe we are on LinkedIn. Maybe the folks on the chat will tell me. If you need to ask questions, we are on the YouTube chat and also on the Discord. And today we will do some little games and survey live as usual using Menti. Nothing to install. Simply open a new tab on your brother's menti.com and I will give you the link. Speaking of which, okay. So today we will show you how to build a reactive application using Spring Framework. And to do so, we will use Azure Database Datastax Astra, Cloud Database in the cloud, and Azure IDE Development Environment Gitpod. There will be a backend and the front end. Moving on, it's simply just getting started. I know you want to get your hands dirty. All right. Um, and first, you know, don't wait. Let's explain you what is Astra. What is the database we will use today? So Astra is a managed service. It's Cassandra as a service in the cloud. Okay, it's provided by Datastax. But there, there is a free tier, and it's a free forever tier. So no credit card, nothing. You simply register even with your GitHub account. Start a database. It will be there forever, 5 gigabytes for, uh, for free for you. And on top of this database, we do have tools and way to scale and API, REST, GraphQL API on top of the database okay, to ease as much as possible the use of Cassandra. And this is the reason why we will use that today because it's free, easy to use, and you don't have to install anything. So Astra is software as a service. Um, yes. So you know what? Let's get rolling. So everybody out there, Hands on part one. See today's hands on. No slide. There will be slide theory, but we really want you to to get the most of this workshop and to start the app. You won't code today, so if you're a beginner, totally fine. I won't ask you to create a unit test to to debug. No, everything is code. I will show you the code, browse how it works, uh, but you should be able to start it. And first. Well, you need a database. So go to dts6.io slash workshop or use the QR code you have on screen and it will route you to here how to start the database. Okay, 
So, and by the way, so today we are using uh, a GitHub repo, Datastax Academy slash Workshop Spring Reactive. The link of the GitHub repo is below me, below the video, uh, and it's forked from the, the Spring Pet Clinic. I will explain uh, that later on. Uh, so in this repo, not only you have the uh, all the stuff to run the app, so start a database, okay? How to fill every single field on Astra, okay? Click Add a Database, select the free tier, okay? When the free tier has been selected, pick, I mean, the cloud provider has been selected for you because I know we are running the free tier on Google Cloud. But hey, if you can see that Astra can run on any cloud and Astra is now multi-region and Astra can do VPC peering with existing cloud. So if you already have some um, application in the cloud is one of these cloud providers, you can make Astra part of your ecosystem with the VPC peering. But by default, the database are set up on our own VPC. Select a region, pick the region that is the closest to you. So I, I am in Paris, so I pick Europe West. I did the screenshot, as you can tell. And when you're done, click configure. <clears throat> then it will ask you to provide database name, key space name, username. I give you here some sample values, but you know you can pick the one you like. Simply please remember your password because even if you can reset your password, it's still, uh, it's always a bit uh, annoying to have to reset your password. Um, yeah, you will have to provide the password in the end zone. Please, okay, ping the URL here. So the URL is just below um, the video, but yes, let me, let me copy the URL for you in the chat. Uh, by the way, in the chat, I am Datastax developer guy, one of the people behind the Datastax developer. So I, I put the GitHub repo and David put the, the link to create the Astra database. Okay. We, we do have time. Two hours is a long time. Let's take the time needed. So when you do have the database uh, ready to go, I mean, with the active state, please do a sum up. So for the key space name, you pick what you like. Uh, as a proposal, we, we, we put pet clinic, uh, pet clinic, either for database name or uh, key space name. But you know what? The application will uh, be clever enough to use the key space you provided. So database name, I put Pet clinic DB and um, key space name, I, I put spring underscore pet clinic. Um, the only constraints I do have for those is really for the password now, I think you need to use at least one um, number, one, I mean, one digit, one uh, alpha numeric char uh, character, one uppercase letter, and eight, the password would be uh, at least eight. Uh, characters. Yeah, Spring Pet Clinic, yeah, as Alex st stated in the chat, it's not really important, but Spring Pet Clinic, yeah, that's what we will do today. Okay, and when you are okay, please give me some thumb up. I really want uh, you to have the database ready um, because then I will go to uh, a few slides, but you know, if you if you're okay, that's better. Okay, so do 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 do. And <clears throat> when you filled all the steps, now you can click on create database. Can I make my screen bigger? Maybe there is no reason to keep this blank space on the left and right. And so it will take a few minutes to spin up. So we are just providing a new container, running Cassandra for you on the platform. So it may take a minute to start. Okay, Babu and Jandran, tell me uh, 
is okay. Cool. So it's working. So Matt, okay. And yeah, simply do uh, part number one. It's ends on one and it's okay. And you should have some so Astra database. See, I'm signing with GitHub. Everything is git star today. <laughs> and see, I do have my database pet clinic in active state. Woohoo, cool. Um, so I will wait, let's say, three more minutes for you to be okay and let's move on. Oh, started very fast, cool. Cool, cool, cool. And when the status is active, see that you can now click on the DB and see that uh, it's free. You do have five gigabytes of capacity. Uh, you add a cluster ID and a you know, database username, pet clinic, and your password. So for Mongta, uh, when you need to choose your plan, you simply click free plan over here on the first part, okay? Just say, I don't want to pay anything. And it will ask you to pick one of the region. So pick the one closest to you and just click configure and just fill field the, the, the parameter as stated or as you wish. So name of the database, I put pet clinic DB. So let me copy that. Uh, but you can put what you like. And so on when we say for key space, spring pet clinic. And for username, pet clinic. And you will I yeah, you may see my password uh, <laughs> during the end zone, but it's not a big deal because there is a client ID, client secret that you won't have time to catch. <laughs> or I will change it after the, the, the workshop because it's recorded, right? You can just pause and get my IDs. So Maurice, I, I, I know you did that before. How do you find the database creation process? Was it complicated or simple, straightforward? I think it was rather straightforward. I mean, it didn't took, take us so much time. And when I look at the chat, it looks, seems like people can follow. Yeah, that's that's cool, and that's that's yeah, that's really the mean of this kind of uh, live stream is really to make people do stuff with you. Easy, cool, um, and so okay, I will wait just a bit more for everybody to have their database. Um, so you can see now that the database um, you can access to Elf. Which will you? Which will spawn a Grafana container and showing all the requests you are doing against your cluster. You do have access to SQL Console, which is uh, which is the shell to interact with Cassandra, very famous in the Cassandra world. We will use that later. You do have the Studio, which is. Uh, kind of Jupyter notebook, but for Cassandra, okay? Um, so let me enter my password in here. Just the shell, okay. And describe key spaces. You don't have to do that. I just try to fill the blank during the time. It's asking for credit card details. So if it does that, you did not pick the free tier. Uh, so we need to really say free, free, free. And if you already have a free database running, you can reuse it for today. But you can only have one free database in your Astra account. Okay, what else can I show you in the meantime? Uh, I can show you Connect, okay? You do have a running Cassandra now, and you can either use Cassandra drivers. This is what we will do today. I really want you to show how to use the Cassandra drivers. But on top of it, you do have the REST API and GraphQL API if you know, you're a front-end 
developer really like to use uh, GraphQL, then it's provided. So it's not only Cassandra as a service. There are some tools around that. And so not today, but on the sample app gallery, you can see that we do have a lot. So Spring Data, Jamstack if you're your front end, um, Next, okay, Gatsby, Spark, and the Spring Pet Clinic will be soon after this workshop. We'll be there soon. Okay, are we good? Should we move forward? Let's stay, let's wait until 25 and we will move on. Okay, documentation, building database. Yeah, I got a single DB. This is my dashboard. It's an active DB. I use the key space spring pet clinic. I am on GCP for free, Europe, and capacity unit one, which is the free tier. Okay, one more minute. And I will give you a little theory about reactive stuff. Okay. I think we do have people ready. Yeah, cool. So people follow, that's cool. I do have 25, let's move on. <clears throat> so today is all about reactive. And so to introduce you to the reactive stack, so just uh, to remember, the database we just created is Astra. We do have a backend using Spring Framework. It's a Spring REST, it's a REST API using the uh, Spring Framework technical stack. This is the part using the reactive. And we do have a UI, okay, a client. It's Spring Pet Clinic Angular, uh, which is uh, one of the UI implemented uh, on top of, you know, the, uh, for the default reference application in the Spring community, which is the pet clinic. Okay, <clears throat> so first, <clears throat> synchronous. And this is for, I mean, for Java developer, this is what we use all the time, okay? When you want to use <clears throat> synchronous communication with Cassandra, you will uh, connect, okay? Initiate a session, and you will start executing query against Cassandra, and you will get your response, okay? So you will send the parameter to the API, the driver will create a query, what we name a statement. I could, don't go into the details today. You will bind the parameter, that's simply mapping parameter to, um, to the query. You execute the query against Cassandra, get back the, 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 the result in an object called a result set, and finally you get the result. So what the issue here, the issue here you can see on the slide is you need to wait during all that time, okay? So if you are running not performant queries and in Cassandra you can do that, I, for instance, select star from a table without providing a where clause, it can take a lot of time if you, um, if you query for a lot of data or a big cluster, okay? So, SWOT analysis, so strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. Every, for, for something we are doing every day, synchronous is very simple. But pretty soon you can hit the issue which is which a, the, the weakness, which is a blocking communication. So um, Cassandra is well known for high throughput, high volume type of workload. So meaning high throughput, if you need to wait for everything getting set to be completed, yeah, your high throughput is a bit compromise, right? Um, so let's see if you can do better. Opportunity, easy to test and maintain, unit test, and all. Yeah, that's very the vanilla type of code we are doing day to day, okay? Easy to test, easy to maintain. Um, issue, scalability, okay? 
on um, a client you have limited amount of thread and so if most of your queries are blocked waiting for a result maybe uh, at some point you won't be able to uh, invoke Cassandra anymore not because Cassandra cannot scale because Cassandra scale out a lot but be because of your client with limited number of threads so how to cope with this limitation so let's go asynchronous okay that's a promise so now with asynchronous you will do the small step in the beginning put the parameter uh, prepare your queries bind the parameters to your queries and boom execute the query but instead of waiting for the result the Cassandra and the driver will give you immediately an object called a completion stage which is uh, in the family of completable feature in the of features the, the future API in, in the Java 8 plus which is simply okay when the data will be ready you will get a callback coming from that and only then you can process the result you know on result boom you will process the result so you will get the async result set and not only a result set on Cassandra every single query is paged and you will get the callback when the first page is loaded okay by default the size of a page is 5000 this is a page size you can make it bigger or smaller for instance if you are working with a web UI there is no point to get 5000 records yeah maybe you get the first page uh, but yeah the callback is per uh, page and you know when you start processing uh, the page one when you eat the last element of page one under the hood the driver will fetch page two for you and you can still process but hey what's happen if you get an error you know processing the result of the completion stage is not that easy you do have two um, two paths to under so first is success okay you get the result set I mean async result set you're happy everything's fine and the second is a completion error which is you got an ex exception and so on, on the exception yeah you need to see okay do I throw an exception do I do I do some um, uh, work around uh, okay you got the point so that's a bit tricky but okay that's still okay normal uh, error it's kind of like a try catch right uh, but the issue is in asynchronous you tend to chain one call after the other just to have nothing blocking I mean as soon as I do have the callback for the first I invoke the second as a callback and the third as a callback and then you chain the treatment and what happened is you nested every single code and so each time you nested the, uh, a new service you have to manage two is it okay is it not okay and now you get the id you get a tree of all the possible case uh, even the first level is failing okay no problem the second level is failing so should i throw the exception up to the first level and under at the first level or process the second level or do a rank around there this is what we call the callback l so what is cool with asynchronous is now you are not blocking anymore you get immediately your futures um, so you can scale okay um, you can scale much more now your web thread are not blocked but you you get the id now you can hit this callback l if the call are nested and you do have a maintain availability uh, error okay and moving on to the promise what about reactive okay i put it in green because reactive is cool right <laughs> okay so this is the reactive manifesto uh, written by some clever guy telling that okay this asynchronous hell is not what we like so let's try to put something better and so they created the reactive manifesto you do have the link on on top uh, right hand corner and basically this is uh, 
See, maintainable, extensible. This is exactly what we were missing with the asynchronous only stack. So what is a reactive service? So the, what we try to achieve is first the service to be responsive. That means the system always responds in a timely manner. Okay? If it's success or not success, you can expect the system to always answer the same in the same time frame. Second is resilient. Okay? The system stays responsive in the face of any failure. Third is elasticity. The system stays responsive under via, uh, varying workload and adapt itself uh, to variable ingestion rates. So that's a bit more, not really in the code, but more scale out, dynamic scalability, uh, things you can achieve with Elastic Load Balancer on AWS, for instance, or in uh, you know, Kubernetes, when you, when you see that one of the pod is not responding, uh, get the else check not running, yeah, you may want to scale out this component. That's part of the reactive, what we want. And message driven, okay? Asynchronous is still at the heart of the system. So the system relies on asynchronous messaging to achieve loose, coupil, loose coupling and isolation. Okay, that's the theory. What about implementation? Well, the leading implementation uh, is the Reactive Stream API. Again, I put you the link. So Reactive Stream is really a specification, okay? And here you can see multiple implementation of this API. So here you do have uh, Reactor, Vertex, Aka, and this is a logo of Spring Web Flux leveraging Reactor, okay? So what object do you find in this specification? Well, um, you, you do have the subscriber and a publisher, okay? And so the subscriber will send a request to subscribe the publisher will get you an object named a subscription. And you, as a subscriber, you will query your subscription. So now you do have an object as a subscriber and you won't query the publisher. You will query the, the object you have, the subscription. You execute, everything asynchronous, and then there is a callback on next, okay, to get the result on next. And you know what? Now you don't have the notification, I mean the callback for every single page, but for every single record. And this is why when you speak about reactive world, you, you think about nice UI that refresh automa you know, automatically because uh, the item the items are sent back to the UI. And the idea is anything happening on the DB you get the callback, you get the notification per record. And so this notification can be bring back up to the API layer and framework like React, Angular, any JavaScript now is able to read that notification coming through the UI. Yeah, you are probably as aware about WebSocket and boom, the UI can be refreshed automatically. So it's now callback at the fine grain level and so you can do uh, fast and small things with this uh, new callback, but also you can do more. So if you, could, if you look at the uh, Cassandra code, that, you know, it's quite reusing the same publisher, subscriber mechanism. And now when I execute, uh, when I bound my statement, I get a flux. So flux is one of the objects used by Reactor. Reactor is a leading implementation of the reactive streams. Okay, reactive stream specification, Reactor main implementation in Java. And so tools like Webflux will leverage on this Reactor object. So in the code, you will see either Flux, which is kind of a list in the reactive world, and Mono, it's a single result in the reactive world. You execute the query, and now coming from Cassandra, you do have a callback for every single row, okay? And which is neat is if you can keep up, you know, um, there is tons of 
things happening at the Cassandra level and you as a client, you are a subscriber and you cannot keep up with that. Well, there is a back pressure mechanism to tell Cassandra, okay, please, please driver, slow down. I cannot keep up. And that's the sweet. That's, you know, that's really what's cool. Um, Cassandra is famous high throughput. If you cannot keep up, yeah, now you can tell Cassandra to slow down. It's for read, but not for write, because there is no way uh, Cassandra could tell you, eh, stop writing, uh, I cannot keep up. Um, but it's not the, the, the topic for today, but on a single node of Cassandra, you can expect about 3,000 transactions per second and per core. So on a machine with eight CPU, it's about 20K requests per second per node. And Cassandra is a distributed system with basic production, three nodes. So basically, very basic, Cassandra can absorb easily 60K requests per second. So as a client, you need to be pretty strong to, to hit that value. But anyway, just telling you, the back pressure is only available for read. Okay, that was a lot of theory, right? Okay, and this reactive, we will apply that to the reference application which is in the Spring community, which is Spring Pet Clinic. So if you go to the spring.io, you will find the reference implementation of the Pet Clinic. But the Pet Clinic is so famous and so widely used and widely used as a reference app that now, there are some people forking and changing the implementation in new way. So I hide a little bit. It's, it's so you can see, you can go on spring-petclinic.github.io and you would see multiple implementation for this sample. See, you can see here the Angular, the microservice, you know, using all the Spring Cloud stack. Uh, and I'm happy now the Spring Reactive is Spark is part of this organization. So again, this organization is community uh, oriented, okay, maintained by people like Antoine Ray, uh, very active, uh, answering, you know, ticket uh, very fast. So thank you to the community, pretty happy to be part of it. And if you start creating some ticket with the sample we are using today, I will probably jump on it. All right, we do have the database, we know uh, that we will use Reactive. So let's move now to the development platform. And on that, I will let the expert speak. I will let Moritz take over and I see, I will get back to my screen uh, later on. So let's see. <coughs> okay, um, now Moritz, you share your screen. Yes, I do. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, Cedric. So let's let's go a little bit deeper into a development environment that runs that runs inside the your browser that runs inside the cloud. Um, so let's take a closer look at at Gitpod. Here on the left, we see it running. We see a screenshot um, of it running. This is basically the website. So if you go to gitpod.io, um, it's super easy to just click on this button, um, try now, and all you need is, a, is an account on GitHub or GitLab or um, bitbucket.org. And with Gitpod, you get an IDE that has quite a bunch of features that focus around um, being ready to code immediately, and that focus around um, collaborating with, with colleagues and also that focus around um, being powerful enough for professional developers and that focus around um, reproducibility so that um, everybody who's working on the project um, gets a reproducible workspace or multiple reproducible workspaces <clears throat> and in more detail so for for teams we we support code reviews and sharing of uh, workspaces and exchanging workspaces snapshots. And to be more 
to offer really, really fast um, workspaces. Um, when you think of what you, you traditionally need to do when you start developing, traditionally you would clone a project and check out a branch and study the readme's and install the tools and run build and run test and um, then after a few um, a few half an hours, hours or even days, you are finally ready to code and Gitpod automates most of this so that from choosing a project to starting to code, you can do this within um, within seconds and that's what we're gonna do. Um, <clears throat> and you can you can follow this along with me. Um, I will provide you a link links in a in a minute. Um, it's free for up to 50 hours a month. And for people that want to use it more professionally or more extensively, we, we also have have paid plans because um, running a full fledged workspace in the cloud is actually quite a heavy thing that also creates costs on our side. Um, so to to follow along, you might you might open up um, <clears throat> Gitpod either on GitLab or on GitHub by by following these um, these QR codes. And um, as you do it, I will I will do it as well. So I will I will switch to to interactive demo mode. Um, so, for example, if you go via GitLab, um, here in So the project is available on GitHub, GitLab. Um, so you can pick what you like. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, for some reason, I am. Um, I'm not signed in for some reason. So just a second. <clears throat> right, so when I'm on this project and when you're signed into GitLab, you have probably seen this um, this button Web IDE before. And since a few weeks, there is also a second button or a, another option in the drop down named Gitpod. So if you click on that one, then a Gitpod workspace will open. And we have this native support for Gitpod in GitLab since a few weeks because we, we Gitpod, we, we um, started a partnership with, with GitLab. So we will be working together to make this work really, really easily. Um, the same works on on GitHub. So if you go to the GitHub project, um, um, you could either install a VS Code extension that installs the Gitpod button here. Or if you do not have this VS Code extension installed, you can go to gitpod.io, uh, or you can prefix the URL with gitpod.io slash pound and press enter. And then um, a workspace will start on this project. You may need to, to log in to Gitpod. Um, that's something I did already. You can do that with your your GitHub 
GitHub or your GitLab account. And what's happening now is that Gitpod starts a workspace um, for me, for you, um, in the cloud. And now we have a running workspace. And when we take a look at the workspace here in the middle, there's already a readme file, the readme file from the repository that is open in an editor, but I will close this for now. Here on the left hand side, I have all the files from the repository. And here on the bottom, I have, I have terminals. Um, and there's stuff happening already. And if I open up a new terminal, I can also see it's a bash. Uh, we are under Linux. Uh, we can run any any Linux commands, and and we see that we have quite a powerful machine where we can just do stuff on the server side. And um, here we see that our pet clinic project has already been compiled, and we see that. We see this message, or we, we see that it has been compiled because here we see the message, the last message from, from Maven that tells us the build was successful. It took um, one minute 40. Thank you. And, and we know um, we didn't wait one minute 40. Um, when we opened up the workspace, this was already done. And that's a feature of Gitpod. We call it pre builds. So, what Gitpod can do is Gitpod can, can run such tasks ahead of time, like before I start a workspace. Gitpod does this like a, like a CI-CD server. So basically, when you do a git push to your repository, then Gitpod gets notified, builds a workspace for your new commit, um, and stores it in the cloud. And later, when you need that workspace, it's just there and ready to code. And you see this nice message of, oh, you just saved two minutes of watching your code build because that ran ahead of time. Cool. Um, and same for same for Angular. Um, and this application or this the application automatically ran, so we can now open this up in a browser, for example, or it can um, I can also open this here in a preview, then I see it in, in Gitpod. And now we see the spring, the spring pet clinic app running live inside my workspace. Um, so the full the full app. So basically from I chose the repository, click on a link, have the running app in my have a running workspace with the app running in it. Takes less than a minute. So that is I think record breaking breaking time for for going from zero to, to being ready to code. Um, but let's Let's look a bit more into the details on how how we actually made this work. So the entry point for this, what Gitpod uses, is the, the Gitpod YAML file. Um, so that's a configuration file that you can place in, in your repository. And it's, it's very useful to place it in the repository because this way it's version controlled and shared with your team. We call this dev environment as code. And the big advantage of this is that the, the setup of your dev environment is always consistent with your code. So you can be sure you get the right version of um, VS Code extensions and tools and so on. And um, the first thing the GitHub gitpod.yaml file does is it says, um, it instructs Gitpod to take this Docker file as a basis for the workspace. And when we take a look at this Docker file, we see, oh, it takes a workspace full image, installs Angular stuff, and installs even more Angular stuff. And when we start a workspace, what Gitpod does is it takes this Docker file, takes the Docker container from it, and launches this as my workspace. Uh, yes, absolutely. Let's make that a bit bigger. So 
this is this better? Yeah, I think just waiting for feedback, but all right. Yeah, zoom in the screen. Yeah, like uh, command plus just to make that. I can do that too. Yeah, perfect. And make your yeah perfect. <laughs> you can put back your uh, brother full full yeah, screen now. Much, too much overlap. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so what Gitpod does is it it takes this Docker file and like when you start a, a workspace. It checks is there such a Docker file in the repository, and if that's the case, it builds a Docker container from this Docker file, and that will be launched as your workspace. So basically, everything that you install here inside the Docker file will be inside your workspace. So you have it, for example, accessible here in the in the shell. And um, you don't need to base it on Workspace Full. You can also base it on Alpine or Ubuntu or Debian or other um, Linux distributions. And so that is a very, very, very powerful way of creating a dev environment, which is exactly tailored to your project. And at the same time, giving you a very convenient control over um, how you manage it, because it gets version control with your, with your code. And inside the Gitpod YAML, um, what we can do is we can, we can specify tasks that should run as a pre-build. Um, so, for example, here, or let's let's look at at React. Here, this is the command for for the pre-build. So, for the pet clinic example, uh, we run the command Maven clean package install as a pre-build. Um, so, just like a CI/CD server, if, for example, Cedric um, keeps on developing on the app and pushes to the Git repository, then Gitpod will run this command to create a fresh workspace from it, store it in the cloud, and later when Cedric or I want to start a workspace on that commit, then we get everything pre-compiled and can be happy about this, <laughs> this message. Um, the command, then later the command actually gets executed when you start the workspace. So um, yes. this and command made sure that when, when I just started the workspace that we can already see a running app. Yeah, and this is why a question we asked to enter your credential. We will do that in a minute. This is setup.sh that will use the credential coming from Astra, initialize the app, and start the app. Yes, exactly. I will um, pass over to Cedric in a while, and then I assume you, Cedric, are going more into details about that one. Um, there's the a bit more conflict here about um, ports. So, for example, the React app is, um, or the Pet Clinic app is opening up um, port 4200. Uh, we need to expose those ports to show them in a preview. Um, config to enable the previews and also um, pre install VS Code extensions that I will talk about more, uh, more in a second. Um, but first, I want to sh show to you that this is actually um, this is a real IDE. This is not a <laughs> this is not a toy thing. So um, Gitpod supports um, VS Code extensions, and here we have Java support installed via VS Code extension. So the Java support that you see here in Gitpod is exactly the same that you see. In VS Code because it's the same VS Code extension as what VS Code uses, and uh, the VS Code extension actually packages the Eclipse um, Java tooling um, language server. So when I, for example, hover over a command and I see the Java doc, that is exactly the same that you would see in um, in Eclipse. Or if I open um, some class, let's. Um, go to some utils and press the content assist and I get the real content assist. So this is like exactly those functions that I can actually open up on this class. This is not a, not a wild guess based on text scanning. Or if I do a control click and click on this, then I can also navigate to the implementation. And we see that this Java code, this is not from my repository, but this is from, um, 
um, associated with the local date dot class. So this, this this Java code is somewhere deep in a jar file in my in my workspace. But nonetheless, for convenience, it's super easy to access it because um, it makes coding so much easier when you can actually read the codes that you're calling. Um, and <clears throat> what else? Um, other features that we have, uh, we can also find references and see um, where this is being called from. There's something that's not working. Um, <clears throat> and one more thing that we can do is um, we can also debug. So for example, I can go here to my Spring application. I can set a breakpoint. And then I can click here on, on debug. And then on the left-hand side, in the debug view, um, <clears throat> I can see how, how the application starts. Oh, that's a lot of information. Now I'm really running out of pixels with my resolution. <laughs> yeah, and you did not so, provide the, 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 the credentials. That I'm running in the Java virtual machine, and here I can see the call stack. And now, for example, I could um, click here to step into the method, and now I'm starting to step into the um, Java Spring um, framework. Yeah, that's cool. I do have a couple of questions coming from the chat now. So first is, does the workspace you are using uh, keep the states, you know, is stateful? You can go back and... Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, so the workspace, as, as long as you run the workspace, it's your Docker container. So you keep all the files, all the processes, and so on. And um, when you close your browser window or when you click on Stop Workspace, um, then the files from the workspace will be will be saved in your user profile. And then in your user profile, um, you get a list of the workspaces that you launched recently. So you can always go back to them and, and start them start them again. You like our app. <laughs> um, and second question is about uh, shortcuts. So is there any um, shortcuts close to what we are we get used to Eclipse or IntelliJ? Yes, instance? absolutely. Um, so if you if you press Command Shift P. Um, or if you um, or go to view, find command. It's just like in VS Code. So you get a list of all commands that you can run. And you, you also see the shortcuts that are already associated with those commands. So you can use all those, those shortcuts. And you can, additionally, you can install VS Code extensions that change shortcuts. So for example, you could install a VS Code extension for, um, for uh, VI shortcuts and thereby make, um, make it behave like, yeah, like VI. <laughs> VI, whoa. No, that's... Yes, but... only do it when you know how to exit, but... Oh, um, geez. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, don't tell me um, about that. What, that's that's really cool. Nice. So it leverages on kind of VS Code and you can install multiple extensions. By the way, in this app, you already have two extensions running. That is, that is very, very true. Um, so let's take a look at this. So here we have, um, um, we have an extensions view. And um, in this extensions view, um, I can, for example, search for, I have the Lombok an um, um, extension installed, and I have the Spring Boot extension installed, and there's also a bunch of built-in extensions uh, pre-installed. And here I can, for example, simply search for um, other extensions. So I can search for Java, and then I find a bunch of other extensions where I can simply click on install. Um, and then when I click on something to 
install, um, I don't know, let's install the Maven, the Maven stuff. Then I can choose whether I want to install it for, for this project. When I install it for the project, then goes it and goes into my, um, I get a marker in my Gitpod YAML, then it will be shared with my team. And when I install it for uh, ISOL, so that's myself, that goes into my user profile. Um, that is where I should put my VI shortcuts or um, a theme that uses coloring that not everybody might like. Um, yeah, then it goes into my user profile and will be there on my projects, but it won't bother my, my teammates. And to show what these extensions can do, um, I already showed that we have the, visual, uh, the Spring Boot extension installed. And if I go to resources and to application.yaml, so this config file from, um, from Spring, and then press content assist here. Oh, it's not so super fast. Then, then we see we, we get content assist for this YAML. So that is this this content. So this the IDE knows exactly which values are are acceptable here, and that is provided by the VS Code extension for um, um, for Spring tools. And I also just noticed that the find references that I wanted to show earlier, it actually popped up here on the left hand side. I expected it elsewhere. That's why I was a bit confused. Um, so we, the find reference feature actually works nicely. And um, <clears throat> to, to really benefit from this um, when you work in a team, there's a few ways that um, that make it super or that are super powerful when you want to work with Gitpod. Um, one is um, reviewing um, pull requests. So for example, now when I go to some other repository, here this is the repository of our um, of our IDE. and open this, then I will get a new workspace that starts and, and it doesn't matter that I already have a workspace running. So this is what I want to show is it's super convenient that here I don't need to interrupt my work just because I want to review a pull request elsewhere. I can have several workspaces that just without problems run in parallel. Okay. Um... Question in the chat, C can you use uh, like private Git, like AWS, Azure code base, or you know, a Git URL you would provide? Um, you can use private repositories from github.com, gitlab.com, and Bitbucket. So they will all have support for private repositories. Okay. Um, we also have support for private, no, for self-hosted GitLab installations. So if you self-host GitLab somewhere, uh, we can also hook this up. And sure. on top of that, we, we offer, um, or you can self-host Gitpod. And, and when you self-host Gitpod, then you can hook it up to mm, mostly anything that supports OAuth. Um, and that can also be a GitHub enterprise server um, or your self-hosted GitLab. And when you self-host Gitpod, then of course you also choose each cloud infrastructure. So then you can, choose, for example, run it on Google Cloud Platform or um, or AWS, and we are working on Azure support. Okay, nice. Um, and so now here's the the workspace for my code reviews is almost there. And here, for example, I see the, the files that have been changed, um, or here's only a file that has been added. And when I click on details, I can also see the PR, and then, for example, I can, um, I 
can click on review or I see the or the conversation from the PR and I can can review conduct my review and inside the file I can also comment on individual lines and that that all gets uploaded to um, to GitHub. Cool. And even more to when you work in a team. Um, let's say now I'm doing some coding and I'm stuck with some something on Astra, but I know that Cedric can help me. <laughs> what I could do is um, I could click here on my on my avatar icon and um, now I know that Cedric is with me. So what I could do is um, click on share uh, share running workspace. So I could invite Cedric to to enter my my running workspace and then we could together work on the same same code. Um, that also works nicely for, for educational settings or for mentoring and unblocking, obviously. But even if Cedric would not be there with me right now, but I know that he's super busy in another meeting at the very moment, but hopefully later today, he might have an hour um, to look into um, or to help me out. What I could do then is then I take a, I take a snapshot from my workspace. Um, so a snapshot is like an um, the current state of my workspace state persisted um, in the cloud. And when I take a snapshot, I get a, um, I get a link. So now Gitpod is taking the snapshot. And once, the, once we have the link, I can share, I could share the link via email or via chat. And if Cedric would click on it, then Cedric would uh, here's the link, um, would get an exact copy of my workspace. So the copy is like fully detached from my workspace, but it contains the files exactly as I left them. Um, so that I could... In, including environment variables and all the modification you did. Cool. Yes, yes, yes. That is super useful for asset work or for handing out exercises. Yeah, or, or you know, multiple... Reducible bug reports. Multiple yeah. state of your exercise, you know. You do have, you know, yes. basic then step one, step two, step three. If you're stuck, go to link step three and everything is, is done for you. You can move on for your exercise. So really for <clears throat> any university uh, or you know, any school, so not only students don't have to install anything on their laptop, but you, know, you could have your uh, courses ready to go with multiple commits and these workshop snapshots uh, stated to each commit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's that's a big part of my or that's my my demo part. Um, <laughs> which is cool. Which is cool. What I thank you. <clears throat> um, if there are more questions, please um, post them now in the chat. Yeah, um, not yet, not yet. But I will uh, watch, and if there are, uh, okay. let's let's take the question. So should um, I should I take to, over to finish, and to finish up? There's cool. two more things I want to stress first. Yes. Um, as I already mentioned, you can use Gitpod on gitpod.io or you can self-host it. We have Terraform scripts to install it on AWS and GCP. Um, and we have a Helm chart to install it on, on Kubernetes. And um, we recently went open source. So you can actually look, look at the source code um, of Gitpod and compile it yourself, try it, run it, um, and of course, um, improve it and, and contribute. Yeah, this is like to hand the lead over or Cedric. All right, all right. So let me go there and there. And let's do some little slides. Um, yeah, let's let's go with slides. Um, okay. Um, yeah, just two questions maybe we should take now uh, before running because it's question relating to the snapshots. And first is, uh, so the snapshot is just a copy. Uh, it's not uh, linked together with the orig original. And so then is how do you merge a snapshot with the original, you know, back together if you need to? Ah, uh, this was good. So, so, so if you... Um... If you create a snapshot and thereby you basically branch branched off your workspace, uh -huh. what you would do is um, you would commit the files that you want to keep to Git, 
and, and push them to your repository and then use the mechanisms of Git to, to, to align them. So you would rebase or Git merge, <coughs> um, however it is necessary. And, and if that is not an option for some reason, of course you can also just download files from your from your workspace to your hard drive and upload them to another workspace, but um, well, is that's just the it's... last resort. Yeah, I think Git is away. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Pretty neat. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's go into a little bit of Spring and using everything we saw just to build the application. Will you? Uh, we still have time, so let's let's go into it. So a couple of weeks a week ago, we introduced you Spring. Uh, so it was two hours only on Spring and Spring Boot. Uh, so I won't go into the details today. I will go fast, but you know, at the heart of Spring, the the, the mechanism that make Spring a superstar in the Java uh, community is really the inversion of control. So now you define a single interface multiple implementations uh, for your interface. And when you need to use this service, you only uh, specify the interface and not the implementation. Doing that, you introduce loose coupling between the user of your service and the service. So it's very easy to do mocking, to do multiple versions of your service. Uh, and you know, even if you have a single version of the service, most people doing that all the time now. It's so cool to introduce a decoupling between layers of your applications. So last time we introduced you the Spring Boot, which is a runtime with everything included uh, in uh, Spring. And if you need more uh, function, you add some Spring Boot starters. So Spring Boot Starter Data, Spring Boot Starter Security, Spring Boot Starter uh, FF4J, why not? I mean, uh, so today we will move to uh, the reactive part, okay? So it's still running inside Spring Boot, but now we are using something called Spring Webflux. So this is Spring Boot with three layers, presentation layer, business layer, uh, persistent layer, using inversion of control in between layers, okay? And Spring Boot will help you package your app as a standalone jar, which is pretty convenient and easy to deploy as container. For instance, you don't have to deploy your app in application server. And I told you, adding some uh, starters, you add some metrics, health check, configuration. Uh, by the way, in the sample today, in Gitpod, we are simply using the uh, Spring, the REST API. But if you go to application.yaml, you see that you can enable Spring Security, distributed stressing with Zipkin, and also Prometheus Grafana stack. It's all there. You simply have to enable the flag when you start the app. So it's all due to Spring Boot and the Spring Cloud world, providing all the dependencies uh, you need. Simply attach what you need. So speaking of now reactive Spring. So, this is the key slide. So what you used to do with Spring MVC, which is the uh, web layers for servlets in the Spring world, uh, uh, both for REST API and uh, controller in the MVC uh, pattern, you know, model, view, controller, where the view tends to be with free marker or time leaf in the Spring world, and the REST API, of course, uh, using uh, the, the, the REST part of, of Spring, um, and you can only use REST controllers and have your UI using any JavaScript stack, of course. So endpoint, it's moving from MVC to Webflux, but that changed something. If you introduce Webflux in your class pass, now all your application must be reactive. That means Spring will scan all your classes, and if one method is not reactive, it's synchronous, for instance, the application won't even start, okay? It will tell you there, you do have a blocking call, I'm not starting. And so now, because you introduce some reactive at the endpoints, because all the nice features I showed you before, a fine grain notification, now you need to be reactive to the full stack. So full stack means at the database level, 
when you interact with the database, so at the connectivity, meaning the driver levels, then in each layer of your application, repository, service, and controllers. So for the connectivity, uh, because we are using Cassandra, we of course using the Cassandra drivers, and the Cassandra drivers provide now ways to execute method uh, in a reactive way. So then, two ways to work with this reactive connectivity stuff. You can either use Spring Data Reactive Cassandra, Spring Data Reactive Cassandra, which is uh, a wrapper around the, the, the reactive uh, driver uh, from Cassandra. Um, this is not what we are doing today. Today, we are simply leveraging all the features from the driver, not Spring Data. Because my point is Spring Data is very strong but it's like really building a boat inside a bottle. So with Spring Data, you do have nice repository, okay, where you simply have to define interface and um, entities and um, method with convention, creating the proper method name will execute the proper query. But what happened under the hood? Now, what about batch statement? What about paging? What about consistency level? All these features from the driver are hidden for you and you tend to forget them and always use the default mechanism. It's not the Spring Data fault. It's because Spring Data is so easy to start with that you are doing the default method and it's not what you should do because there are way, be way better things to do to be much, much faster. So what I did today is I simply use the driver to see everything it can, it can do for you and later, you can use Spring Data, Spring Data Reactive to, to, to get that, um, yeah, to make that happen. And, you know, with Spring Data, <clears throat> when you get stuck with the repository, you switch to Cassandra in class called Cassandra Operation, Cassandra Template, and guess what? You are using the class from the drivers, okay? So, um, I do have this, the implementation of the Spring Pet Clinic app using Spring Data Reactive as well. That could be another workshop. So today let's dig into, um, let's dig into the, the, the real thing, everything you can do with Cassandra driver without being constrained by the, of the over, uh, overlay spring data, okay? Okay, so backend code review, all right. So first at the database level, okay? So my, the, I implemented this app. And so I took a, a model which is relational. Okay, if you look at all the impl existing implementation uh, of the pet clinic, it used, it's only relational, SQL. And so there are some joints all over the place. So uh, the business domain is pet clinic. You do have pet own, uh, you know, you do have uh, owner owning pets, and the pets can go to visit. And for the visit, you will you will uh, contact a vet which is quite as easy. So you totally understood foreign key between owners and pets, foreign key between pets and visit, and, you know, integrity constraint, visit, pet, uh, vet. <coughs> In Cassandra, no joints, no integrity constraint, no acid transaction. And so I simply uh, use the, you know, the, the method that is explained in DS220 on this channel is thinking, take your entities, take all the query you need to build your app, and try to first doing one table per request, even if it's mean duplicate the data, it's not a big deal in the Cassandra world. I know it's surprising for people coming from relational. This is how it works. Don't be afraid to duplicate the data. And so after that, I try to, to, to find ways to maybe reduce the number of tables and it ended up doing this data model. Okay, so moving on. Okay, then is connectivity to Cassandra. So connectivity to Cassandra is done by uh, the drivers. Uh, maybe I will show the, you uh, how it works more in the code. And the repository service controller. So I put here the, the, the schema, you, the, the, ar the architecture, you do have the same in the GitHub repo. Uh, so what you simply need to realize is um, you would you will have mostly a DAO for single for each entity, 
And then for services, you can have one services per DAO or you can uh, uh, use the business service layer to aggregate and compose data coming from multiple DAO. And what is cool with the reactive is um, now if you need to get all the pet from an owner, uh, you, can, you may still need to do N plus one select. So get details for every single uh, pet. But with the reactive stack, you can do that all together and get the values for every single pet asynchronously and get the result when you get all the requests. All right. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's go to the code, okay? All right. So um, we add a database. It's running. We are happy and we do have an empty key space. What I will do is I will copy my credentials you know, just to have values to, to be used in, in the Git pod. So what I do, uh, so I follow the step written there. It's pretty quick, okay? It's simply create a service account and copy the credential. So if I go to my database, I will go on the top, click on my name, okay? This is what has been asked. Scroll down to the bottom just to, saw, just to see the security settings. I do have here my security settings. So if not, I will add a service account. And boom, I do have a service account. From there, I will go here and say, copy credentials. Okay, uh, I can maybe open, can I, yeah. can I open? Yes, uh, this is not what I want. Yeah, so this is what is in my clipboard. It's a JSON with my client ID and client secret. The thing you need to make pause and steal all my data in my database. But yeah, it's a demo database that would I will eventually terminate the database now after this workshop. All right. So with this credential in my clipboard, let's get started. I'm going to GitHub, okay? And I will use the uh, open, in GitHub, uh, open in GitPod button I put there, but because I use the extension shown by uh, Moritz, I can also simply click on GitPod button over here. And see, look at the URL, it will open Gitpod and use my, my Gitpod. So it's starting. Let me hide this guy. Is it security credential per DB per account? True. Per service account per DB, I guess. But now you are asking, I should. I should try if I cannot access another database with the same account. Because it's at the organization level. So I can probably use contact multiple uh, database with the same service account. This is a question to ask to, to, to people at Datastacks because you know what? I always use the free tier, so I always have a single um, I always have a single um, database. Okay, so um, two tabs. Uh, one is the UI, okay, everything has been done for me and the UI is already running on port 4200. So I can open the browser and the UI is there. But the UI uh, cannot contact the backend because the backend is not started. So if you look at the uh, backend tab, okay, I was asked to provide my credentials. So guess what? I will pass my credential, which is a JSON. So this is a small setup.sh script I have created for you. And what it's done, it's simply creating some environment variables. Oh, it did not ask me for my password. Whoa, that's so strange. Not that much because uh, in the Gitpod world, even if you delete your um, even even if you delete your workspace, you you can keep your environment variables. And so Astra DB password was already there saved. And so I I, I, I had no there is no point for me to uh, provide it again. 
Okay, so see, so now the database has been started. I can open the database. Okay, first I show the full demo, then I go into the code. So now the backend is started. And so one call you can make, it's going to the pet type because it's a, a referential data. So it, it has been populated for you. So what the application does as startup is creating the expected tables and putting data where needed. You know, that's pretty cool. So I can see what are the pet types in the DB. Okay, so I will go try it out and execute. And see, those are <coughs> all the uh, pet types available in my, in my, um, in my database. Uh, and so during the type, uh, during the time you are starting your backend, I can go to my database, maybe here, show you the SQL console. You don't have to do it. Simply, uh, I will wait for you to start the front, the backend. Copy your credential, copy in the terminal, provide the password, you're good to go. And so remember, Gitpod has uh, downloaded all the dependency, uh, did all the uh, Maven command for us, um, and also execute the pre-build. Okay, so describe key spaces. Is it big enough? Should I make it bigger? Okay. So describe key spaces. Uh, and see, I use Spring Pet Clinic. Okay. Describe tables. Okay. Um, yeah, if you just created the database, you don't have to provide user password. This is because I'm using an older database and the no password to provide to uh, open the SQL console has been released a couple of days ago. Okay, so these are all my tables. And um, if I want to see all the pet types, you know, the one I show you in the Swagger UI, I will go here and I will do simply select from. Okay, so now the pet types are those guys, bird, cat, dog, hamster, lizard, snake. All right. Um, I can create a new one from the swagger, uh, but you know, that's not the point. What is uh, pretty neat is look at that. Gitpod just uh, opened a public API. So the, P the API was expected to run on 9966. So what it does is simply map into uh, 9966 on 80. And now everybody can access that. You could access my, my um, my, this URL if you wish. And so what we did in the beginning in the, in the launch of the, of the Angular, we simply evaluate with GP URL 9966 what should be the backend URL. And like that, cross finger, if I click on pet type, now the UI is communicated to the backend. And I can add a new, so let's see, uh, lizard, dog, cat, what's next? Uh, so what's, what's, what kind of pet do you have, uh, Moritz? <laughs> a lion, okay. <laughs> you said turtle. Oh, Sometimes. turtles, yeah, why not? Okay, so now let's go to the turtle. So I'm editing the reference table. If I go to the database and ask for the data, of course it has been updated, okay? It's not a mock. We are communicated from uh, this UI to the database. So, and you know, before going to code, let's make a poll. That's cool, right? We do a full working app with UI and backend and database, and you don't have to install anything. And it's free. All right. Um, okay, moving on. So let's go back now to um, the heart, the code. And to show the code, guess what? I will use uh, my ID, no, just kidding. <laughs> I will use Gitpod. <laughs> okay, so remember, first, uh, let's go each step. First, the connectivity. So if I go to main, Java, do, 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 everything is there. Conf, okay. Conf and maybe application.yaml, which is the Spring Boot uh, configuration file. Okay, so 
This is the one where it's open before. Let's make it bigger. This is a configuration file. I have enabled some actuator, spring. See, you can enable zipkin by simply enable true. Uh, you can enable using uh, the secu spring security by enable true. And you can either use Astra, which is a default behavior I do have, or you can use local Cassandra. If you want to lose, if you want to use Zipkin, local Cassandra, Prometheus, Grafana, you need to start all these components using Docker, and the Docker Compose is there for you. Everything is there. Okay, Prometheus, Grafana, Zipkin, Cassandra, yada yada yada, everything is there. Uh, so if you want to run everything locally, do it. The Docker Compose is there for you. But today, everything is in the cloud. So let's see. I do have application uh, application dash astra dot conf. So to set up the data stacks driver, you simply need a single conf file application dash astra dot conf. Okay, and this file can have hundreds and hundreds of fine grain configuration key. So first, if you use Spring Data now, you need to use the small keys, I mean the limited number of keys available in, in application YAML in Spring Data, and you have not access to all these stuff by default. This is There is a way to do it, but it's not well written in the documentation. Yeah, you simply go to basics and do basics. So first look at that. You can, so this is the Astra Conf, okay? So I'm using environment variables I have created when I've imported the JSON. I do have the same file for local configuration, and now I'm using uh, Docker Cassandra 9042. Okay, so level zero configuration files. Okay, level one config. So what I do, Cassandra config. Okay, I will define a bin SQL session. Okay, implementing synchronous, asynchronous, and reactive calls. Okay, simple as that. And depending of the flag use Astra, I will load one file or the other. Okay, very easy, very basic. You've got the ID. Uh, maybe one thing to say about configuration before going further is um, I use Spring Security, and I uh, if you enable Spring Security in the application.yaml, you will use one class security enable config, okay? Uh, implementing a filter with Spring. Uh, and if you disable, you don't have the Spring uh, security filter. And same for the security, uh, Swagger, you know, the small framework we are using to generate this UI. Uh, if, you, uh, if you disable the uh, security, this is what it looks like. If you enable the security, there is a new button over here to provide uh, user as password as HTTP uh, authentication basic. All right, config. Okay, now what about DAO? One step above. Okay, one step above DAO. So let's pick one of the entity. You know, they're all working the same. Uh, pick one entity and, and see what's going on. Okay. So let's pick uh, one. Vets. Okay. So vet at the DB layer first create a entity. Okay, so we are using Lombok not to create any getter setter. It's been it has been done for us uh, at compile time. Uh, it's an entity. Okay, nothing much to say about that. But we are using uh, annotation. Oh, those annotations come from the default drivers. Not Spring Data. I told you, but you can do quite the same with. Uh, spring data. So here the partition key, clustering colon, provide name for the columns. And with that, you do have a mapping from object to the tables. So let's use that in a DAO. So like spring data, uh, in the default Cassandra drivers, there is a DAO mechanism, uh, so-called mapper, where you simply define the interface and a code will be available for you uh, as is, okay? Yes, and you create a mapper referencing the DAO, okay? But now, <clears throat> you do have access to the SQL session. So that means 
you can here easily create the table. So see, in the mapper, uh, I create the different table using my SQL session. It's available for me right here. And, then, and the, at the DAO level, I can define some uh, you know, advanced uh, queries in the select over here. Uh, okay, that's entity level. Now let's move to service level. Oh, by the way, so at the driver level, um, all the method will return map reactive result set. And the reason is the driver won't force you to use either reactor or another uh, reactive implementation like Vertex. So it provides you the publisher, which is the interface, the specification. Uh, and so, because Spring Webflux is, is using um, Reactor at the service layer, when I invoke my DAO, so this is my service, okay, injecting multiple DAO over here. And so, do, 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 look at that. I will say Flux. Remember, Flux is really the class you want to use when you return a list of something. So, the DAO got me find all which is a uh, you know map re as a result ah mapid reactive result set and i map that as a flux and now i can uh, uh, move from any entities to the vet entity which is the entity used by the service layer remember when that's basic spring stuff at each layer you want to have dedicated entity at DAO layer, I have vet entity using annotation related to my implementation, my database. Then at the service layer, I don't want any dependency to my database. So I create a new classes, even if it's exactly the same. Uh, but most of the time, there are some mappings because this class, we get some info coming from multiple um, DAO. Um, so what about using URM? So in Cassandra, there is no are okay uh, there is no relation so we are using object mapping because there is no relation joints does not exist in cassandra so uh, this mapper or spring data are really the object mapping so it's kind of ibatis ibanet if you wish uh, look at that if you look at the do interface i will you know uh, select select delete update see I update and I provide my object, which is really like connection.save in the Hibernate world. So, but you know, we do have an entity, I save my entity, um, I update my DB, but no, it's OM, not ORM. That's kind of the same, but it's not hooked. It's not magically, oh, I will update my object and boom, it will magically uh, update my database. Um, so I have used Hibernate back in the day and, you know, the developer manipulating, <laughs> manipulating the, uh, this data, uh, this object layer and having some uh, updates in the database, I can guarantee that DBA ate that because you're not aware of which kind of query you are firing against the database. And this is one of the reasons that now people tend to put API on top of the database because they don't want you to execute any query because you, you have fun with the ORM. Uh, true story. <laughs> okay, so that's your DAO. Let's move to the service layer. So I, I translate the result set for mono or flux, depending on what I like. And I'm using a mapping to map the entity from DAO level to service level. So if I go to the mapping, let's see, I do have some utils, mapping, that's, okay, stupid mapping, field to field, okay, put that field in that field, put that field in that field. There are some framework existing to help you with that mapping, but, you know, my point of view is it's, it's faster to do that like that instead of expecting some yet another layer of annotation to do the mapping. And that's just me. You can, you can do whatever you like. So, uh, I do have my services over here. Let's see what I have. It's simply, you know, uh, it's really code like you would code now with uh, Java 8, 
it's all about, it's really close to using streams, you know, reactive streams. Once you get either a mono or a flux from the result, now you can do map, okay, mapping from one object to another asynchronously for every single record. You can flap map, so you can do the same, uh, but in a dedicated uh, async call for every single item. Uh, and so, at the controller level, Spring Web Flux, we expect to return either mono or flux. So make sure that at the service layer, everything has been done for you. Uh, just the last word on these classes is look at that. At initialization of the class, because I do have after set properties, I have uh, implemented initializing Bing, uh, just, just uh, Spring stuff. This is why the database is filled when you start. And by the way, the everything in Reactive is lazy. If you simply uh, create the mono, if you don't have anybody to subscribe to this mono, nothing will happen. You need a terminal call. And this is why I put a little subscribe in the end. You do not want to do dot .block because dot .block will get you everything what you need. But I, I can guarantee if you put some dot .block in the code, then Spring Web Flux will go after you. <laughs> <laughs> and say, I don't start. I saw some uh, blocking code. Okay, so, do, 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 and now the controller layer, and it's all working the same. So now I keep reusing the same annotation uh, from, uh, you know, Spring MVC, Spring REST, so it's still get, uh, Swagger API are still the same. Now, instead of returning a list of vet, I return a flux of vet like that. So really, um, at that point, controller is all about boilerplate and login and error management because all the, all the code to compose has been done at you know, the service level. And service level is all about aggregating data coming from multiple DAO using the nice features coming from Reactive, you know, the flat map and enrich the object, populate the object from source coming from multiple data asynchronously. And then see it's pretty close to what you have in uh, default Spring Boot app. Simply now we need to move everything from list to flux, anything from uh, object to mono, make sure and anything is blocking in your app. And you know, sometimes playing with all the stack dot map dot list dot flat map dot default if empty uh, in the end is pretty elegant code you know in two lines you you you, you do a, a lot of stuff but at the same time you know coming to this uh, code sometimes it's a bit tricky so now which is neat with this application you do have a full working app doing crud create read update delete uh, both for single entities and on uh, groups of entities and really, it's not really about all the decision I made to build the app. It's really you have a running app with Spring Security Enable, with distributed, tracking, uh, distributed tracing enable if you wish. So use it as a template when you need to build an app. And this is what you know the Spring uh, Pet Clinic community is there for. Uh, and you can see that uh, a lot of Java developer and Spring developer really use these, uh, really use these, uh, those repo to, uh, uh, what I would like you to, so didcom.com slash this guy. So this is a reactive sample, okay, pretty neat. But here you do have the React.js for the UI, Angular for the UI, microservice, Kotlin, and it's not the same, you know, cloud, REST, uh, I use REST as my you know, base code to work, and I switch from this guy to the reactive one, moving from MVC to Webflux and changing the data model because I'm using a NoSQL database. But here, you do have GraphQL, uh, you do have Cloud Config, Data GDBC, Microservice Config. So if tomorrow you wish to start an app on Spring, get a look at this uh, community uh, website um, and contribute if you can. Um, I think uh, they are doing a great job by providing uh, ready-to-go samples. Okay, I was in speed mode. Uh, do we have a question? 
uh, why not we modify the UI and DB layer first? Uh, to, 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 to. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you, yeah, yeah, so I, I got your point. So at the initialization in after set pro properties, uh, because I, I, I specif specifically invoke subscribe, yeah, the, the, the overall um, starting process will wait for this to be, to be, to be done. Yes, mono object flux list. Yeah, true. And uh, flux or, or mono uh, are really working like streams in the Java 8. Yeah, you, you get the map, your reduce, your, uh, you know, um, and the, you know, sometimes you are, at, you are very tempted to go back to streams and start doing, uh, because you can stream as well flux. Uh, but no, you should avoid stream and stay in can because um, yeah, you don't want to block at any point. Okay, all right. So um, we we went to the through the code the code review. You do have the sample running on your uh, on your cloud instance, not your laptop. Uh, I hope it has been uh, helpful to you. And nevertheless, you do have a working app now. For you to use as a template and so this is the logical architecture of the app okay um, this is the one i've used and this is the one uh, completely built and started by gitpod for you and i uh, what we did what moritz did is define this guy as a sub module of this guy and so when you open uh, your workspace with that, these guys are already there. It has been pulled as a Git sub module. I was not aware it was possible. I, I find that pretty useful. Okay, that's the database. And that's stuff I did not enable on Gitpod. It's working with Docker, um, but you can do that if you start the app locally. Oh, for in so question about integration test. So for integration test, um, of course, you don't want them to block. And so uh, Webflux provide a pretty nice web client. So it's not the default HTTP client or async HTTP client. It's called web client. And you do have the sample uh, in the app in the SRC test Java. Thank you all for the session today. And thank you to Moritz, especially to First, to provide the nice Gitpod platform we're all using every uh, Wednesday to, to demonstrate uh, what can be done on top of Cassandra, and also to be there today and to show and you know explain what is Gitpod and what you can do with it. Yeah, thank you that I that I could be here. It was that was fun. I really liked it. Yeah, no, that's great. And you know what? We both of you are doing the same in a couple of hours. So until then. Thank you very much all and see you next time. Bye. All right. See you. And as always, don't forget to click that subscribe button and ring that bell to get notifications for all of our future upcoming workshops.